Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to the third non-commutative geometry seminar. Uh, so, so before I introduce the speaker, let us uh, mute ourselves. And also, if you have questions during the uh, lecture, uh, please uh, ask it via chat or raise your hand. Um, so our, our speaker today is Nigel Hickson from uh, Pennsylvania State University, and he will talk about the, a counterfactual history of the hyperelliptic Laplacian. All right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Jean-Michel, who's in the audience, uh, will, will be able to certify, there he is, uh, will be able to certify that this is a counterfactual history and, and not uh, what actually happened. I, I tried to invent a story to uh, explain as, as simply as possible what this wonderful device is that uh, Jean-Michel invented. And um, so I apologize to Jean-Michel uh, in advance for telling lies, but, but it's, it's in the title. It's a counterfactual history. It's not the actual history of uh, this particular um, development in, in, in mathematics. So I shall try to answer the, the basic questions like you see them here over the course of the next hour. I, I started to think about this. I went to a lecture of Jean-Michel in, in Cortona and I got very excited because I was sure that what he was doing was related to, to something that I was thinking about in, in, in discrete series. And so I tried to learn, learn this stuff. I remember I went to uh, Bonn and, and with Richard, we, we sat down and we tried to puzzle out just a few basic things. And we got very, very confused uh, right at the very beginning. Anyway, I persevered and, and uh, after a short time, I realized that uh, the work I'm going to describe was not related to the problem I was interested in, but it's, it's really amazing what, uh, what is going to emerge from uh, this, this work of Jean-Michel. So I'll try to tell, tell that, even though the original purpose for which I would try to learn this uh, material turned out to be, to, turned out to be nothing. All right, let's not keep anyone in suspense. What is the hyperelliptic Laplacian? There it is, uh, at least for a, a circle. It's this uh, differential, partial differential operator. When I say it's the, the operator for a circle, actually it acts on, on, on a cylinder. It acts on a circle times a line, like you see. And it's a little mysterious uh, what it is, uh, although you can certainly see some friendly parts to the operator. You see the harmonic oscillator, that's, uh, that's a friend. Uh, you see why DDX, that's not a friend that we know very well in, in non-commutative geometry, but it, it's a friend nonetheless. It's the geodesic flow, the generator of the geodesic flow. If you think of the cylinder as the tangent bundle uh, of the circle, and, and then you sort of combine these with some mysterious uh, coefficients uh, like you see. Uh, and speaking of coefficients, uh, it's obvious uh, that because B is some parameter, it's not just one operator, it's a family of operators, and that's extremely important. To this story. So it's not the hyperelliptic Laplacian so much as the family of hyperelliptic Laplacians. There are a, a large number of variations on the basic definition, by the way, and I'll, I shall be talking here about the version appropriate to, to Lie groups, to reductive Lie groups, mostly compact groups, because that's a, a little bit simpler. And so here I'm thinking of uh, R modulo Z as a compact group. Of course, it's also a locally symmetric space. And, and it can be treated in, in that way too. But it's best for this talk, talk to think of it uh, uh, as a group. Okay, so it's a family of operators. What is it not? It's uh, certainly each of these individual operators is not an elliptic operator. There's two derivatives in the y direction, but only one derivative in the x direction. So it's not elliptic, at least in the traditional uh, sense. It's also not a self adjoint operator because uh, the, so you, the, the, just the, the way the operator is written, the, the, the real and the imaginary parts are uh, separated by the big plus sign, and um, and they're both there. It's neither it's neither self adjoint nor skewer joint, and the, the two parts don't commute with one another. That's evident too. So it's not even a normal operator, or what's the right word? Formally normal operator it doesn't commute with its formal adjoint. So it's it's a bit of a challenge to think about this operator because of all of those uh, problems. And uh, okay, we'll come to all of those things in in, in due course. What is it good for? Well, this is probably the simplest uh, advertisement for the, for the hyperelliptic Laplacian. It's the Selberg trace formula. And uh, I wrote down some details on the slide, but of course, many of you will be familiar with this. It's an interesting formula from the point of view of uh, index theory and, and spectral geometry, as I'll remind you in, in a couple of slides. 
Anyway, what's going on here is that on the left-hand side are, are the eigenvalues of the Laplacian on this surface, the lambdas, and on the right-hand side are the closed geodesics uh, on this surface, those are the gammas. The surface is supposed to have, unlike in the picture, it's supposed to have a constant curvature minus one. That means that the closed geodesics form a discrete family, and you just add up over all closed geodesics, and the only uh, additional thing to say is you're allowed to repeat a geodesic. I mean, you're allowed to go over the same track multiple times. Multiples of the same of, of a single primitive geodesic are allowed. So each geodesic has not just a length L of gamma, but a primitive length uh, L zero of gamma. And this is uh, this is the formula. And one of the things you can do with uh, Jean-Michel's hyperelliptic Laplacian is, is prove formulas like this in, in a rather fascinating way, which uh, I'll try to uh, describe to you. I'm mostly going to talk not about Selbo, um, <clears throat> but, but about the, <laughs> this identity here at the top of the page, uh, it, which is a very simple case of the, the Poisson summation formula, which itself is a very simple fact in, in Fourier analysis. Um, but it has the same flavor as uh, Selberg's formula. What you see in this formula on the left-hand side are, are the eigenvalues of the Laplacian on a circle of circumference C. I stuck in the circumference just so you can see what's going on a little more clearly. We have the eigenvalues of the Laplacian on the left-hand side in, in the exponents. And on the right-hand side, we have the lengths of the closed geodesics. Of course, if the circumference is C, then the geodesics have length n times C uh, for all of the different uh, n's. And uh, so it's like the, the Poisson summation formula. Uh, the left and the right-hand side are, are theta functions, of course, were really the same theta function with a different argument. And, and so this is an identity which is very familiar in mathematics. And what I shall do to you is explain how to prove this instance of the Poisson summation formula in the world's most complicated way. Uh, there's uh, there's a, an enormous investment that you have to put into Jean-Michel's machinery before you start uh, getting uh, dividends out of the machinery. At the beginning, uh, the investments far exceed the, the, the dividends. And in, in particular, to prove the Poisson summation formula, what I'm going to show you is, is close to insanity. But the, the point is that once you've done all of the effort for the circle, compact groups are, are not much more different than even non-compact groups, reductive groups, like for example, SL2R, which you need for the Poisson summation formula, then you're a long way uh, along the way to handling those groups just by having dealt with uh, the circle. And the higher the rank of the group, SL2, SL3, SL4, uh, the more and more effective the method of the hypoelliptic Laplacian uh, becomes and the more and more difficult it becomes to establish uh, formulas by any other means. In theory, uh, Jean-Michel is competing with, with Harish Chandra and it's like the, the hare and, and the tortoise and, and Harish Chandra is the hare and he gets a very big head start and, and off he goes very quickly to establish some of these formulas. But in time, this, uh, this tortoise method of, of Jean-Michel catches up. It's very powerful and uh, inevitable in the, in the direction it takes and, and eventually uh, it becomes very efficient in, in determining formulas like the one you see. I have two keyboards in front of me and I have to remember that if I if I touch one of them, it will have no effect. And if I tap the screen on the other, that will have no effect either. But this does work. Okay. Here's just a little bit more about the Selberg formula, just enough to see uh, in, in more focus what, what Jean-Michel actually does. So uh, we have a hyperbolic surface. Its universal cover is the Poincaré disk or the upper half plane. And uh, the fundamental group can be thought of as a, as a subgroup, a discrete subgroup of SL2R or PSL2R. Uh, and so you can realize S as a locally symmetric space, like I did in, in the top line. And uh, then there's an, uh, a simple but important fact in red at the top. This is sometimes called the pretrace formula, which says that the heat kernels for the surface, which are complicated to understand, and the heat kernels for the universal cover, which are much more accessible, especially thanks to the work of, of Harris Chandra, they're related in this easy way by an averaging. You average over the group and you obtain from the easy heat kernel, relatively easy heat kernel upstairs, you obtain the heat kernel downstairs. Well, if you take the, if you integrate now over, over P, little p, uh, of course you'll convert this heat kernel into a trace. That's what you see on the left-hand side of the next formula. And now on the right-hand side, you'll have an integral of a sum. But if you switch the order of the integral and the sum and you do a bit, little bit of tidying up, then you'll right, realize the trace of the heat kernel, the sort of thing that people study in spectral geometry. You'll realize it as this sum over conjugacy classes in the fundamental group. And there are some weights, which are volumes, 
uh, in this particular case, they're volumes of, of sphere bundles. So they're basically areas of the surface uh, S. Uh, there are some weights and then there are some new traces. And these new traces, I see a left off a parenthesis there. These new traces are just averages over conjugacy classes. So uh, we don't generally pay much attention to these traces in, in operator algebras because they're not positive traces, but they're traces nonetheless on the G, uh, G equivariant smoothing operators upstairs on, on the universal cover. And um, the trace which you might seriously be interested in, the one on the surface S can be expressed in terms of these traces. And what Jean-Michel actually does is he provides formulas for the, for the traces, these gamma traces that you see on the last line. So that's the, 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 the target here is to find such, um, such or compute such orbital integrals, not for arbitrary functions, but to compute such orbital integrals in the case of, of, of heat kernels like you see in this formula. Uh, okay, I forgot to say that you can throw in, it's rather important for later developments, you can throw in a, a representation of, well, in this case, SO2 of, of the maximal compact subgroup and uh, you obtain for each group uh, a whole family of orbital integrals to, to, to calculate, or maybe orbital integral is not quite the right word, twisted orbital integrals, and, and Jean-Michel calculates all of those. Let me say that uh, so does Harish Chandra in, in theory, and um, in particular, the two methods are in direct competition. If gamma, the little element gamma in the fundamental group is the identity element, uh, if gamma is the identity element, this, this integral, this orbital integral is just evaluation at a single point. The space you're integrating over, which is the G modulo some centralizer is, well, it's just a point because everything centralizes the identity element. So in the case of the identity element, uh, the integral just becomes a point, an evaluation at a point. Uh, and this particular evaluation was studied intensively by Harish Chandra. He in, obtained the, the Plancherel formula, which is a particular way of expanding this trace, uh, the gamma trace where gamma is the identity in terms of the characters. Uh, and amazingly enough, even though you're integrating just over a point, Jean-Michel's method applies in this situation and gives you another version of the Plancherel formula. And it's a fascinating project to, to try and reconcile those two things, which uh, Yan Li Song and Xu Shen, well, that's one student of each of us, Jean-Michel and me, uh, are studying right now, former students. Okay, uh, so now I'm going to uh, depart a little bit or return to uh, compact groups. I just gave you a little hint, uh, I hope, of what this uh, method is all about, but I'm mostly going to talk from now on about compact groups. In fact, I'm mostly going to talk about um, the circle, like I said. Just a few slides uh, about uh, the method of spectral geometry and its relationship to the, the, the types of calculations we were contemplating on the previous pages. Um, for, for this particular audience, I'm probably saying more than, more than I need to on these slides. So there at the top of, of the slide is the heat equation. And uh, in the world of spectral geometry, uh, which began with the work of Hermann Weyl, uh, initially resolvents were used to determine uh, features of the, the spectrum of a, of a surface, the set of eigenvalues of the Laplacian. But since the work of uh, Katz in the, in the, in the 50s, so the preferred method, like I said, is, is through the heat equation. And uh, as, as everyone in this audience knows, uh, the heat kernel can be expanded in an asymptotic expansion. And, and as soon as you get started in this, you just write down the first term of the asymptotic expansion, which in the case of a, a circle is just a reciprocal term, one over four pi t, like you see here. As soon as you get this far, you've already proved Weyl's asymptotic law. So it's a very efficient method. It's a bit like uh, the method of the hyperelliptic Laplacian. It's sort of, a, sort of an effort to get it set up. But once you've got it set up, results come rather quickly. So here's Weyl's asymptotic law. Uh, McCain and Singer famously pushed this further out along with several other people, but, but McCain and Singer's name is, get attached to this more than anyone else. Uh, the next term is a curvature term in, in the case of surfaces. It's just the Gaussian curvature divided by 12 pi and so on. And then there are, there are higher terms. Uh, and you might ask, uh, if you go far enough out and you collect all the terms together, are you going to see uh, what Selberg so this uh, Selberg formula? The answer is no, because all of the interesting terms in the Selberg formula, all the terms involving the geodesic spectrum, they're actually order uh, t to the n for, for any n. They don't appear in the, in the asymptotic expansion at all. They just uh, wash away. It is true that the integral, which you saw in, in the Selberg formula, which corresponds to what happens for the identity conjugacy class, it is true that it has an asymptotic expansion in t. Uh, and it is true that it recovers the McCain-Singer formula in this curvature minus one. Uh, case. 
But if you're interested in Selberg, you're not going to see it by, by the usual methods of spectral geometry, by developing the heat kernel as an asymptotic expansion. Same thing for, for the circle case for this Poisson summation formula. And it's, it's kind of an interesting fact. It's a little disappointing maybe, but it, it puts, uh, shines an interesting light on what Jean-Michel actually did because he uses methods which are really not, which are certainly born from the heat equation. And they, these methods will in fact recover, will in fact recover the, the asymptotic expansion. So it's rather remarkable that methods which are demonstrably useless uh, to obtain Selberg's formula, in the end, in some roundabout way, they, they, they do the job. All right. Uh, this talk has three introductions, and the reason is it's a complicated subject, and I kept thinking, how, to, how should I pitch it? How should I pitch it? Uh, so I decided just to write three introductions. You, I give you, that gives me three chances to try and explain what's going on. So now we know what the, the method of the hyperelliptical Poisson is, is more or less about. And uh, what I'm going to do now is try to construct an, an interesting operator. And there are three ingredients which are familiar to, to all of, uh, all of uh, the people in this audience, namely the Dirac operator, the, the harmonic oscillator and its, its famous uh, square root, which I'll remind you about, and then the Kasparov product. I say the Kasparov product, but the, you know, the, uh, it's just some algebra which, which I'm talking about here, no, no famous M and N averaging operators or anything like that. Uh, and so I'll try to build something interesting using these three uh, ingredients. And uh, when you put them together in, so to speak, the obvious way using the Kasparov product, you get something which is not the hypoelliptic Laplacian. And so we still have to go from, from the, the logical object, which KK theory or index theory, which would produce in step one, to the actual object, which is the hypoelliptic Laplacian. And so I'll try to explain how that might have come about. I have a sort of fictional story to tell about how that might have come about, which, uh, well, Jean-Michel can comment on this at the end. It's, he'll get a chance to speak after me, I guess, uh, by, by doing something wrong with the Kasparov product. How many of us have not done something wrong with the Kasparov product at one time uh, or another? Okay, so uh, in steps one and two, uh, I'll try to show you, uh, explain or tell a creation story for this hypoelliptic Laplacian. And then once it's created, you're not done. Uh, it's, the operator is created with a certain a goal in mind that in order for it to be useful, you have to see it from two different points of view, as is usually the case. So you get an interesting formula by calculating the same thing in two different ways. Uh, and so, and what's missing it, uh, so far, just in steps one and two, is any kind of geometry. So I'll try and explain how to put geometry back into the picture. All right, so the next several slides should be just relaxing, floating down the river for uh, this audience. Here's the Dirac operator on the circle. Well, it's not actually the Dirac operator on the circle because the Dirac operator on the circle acts on spinners, which are a one-dimensional uh, bundle on the circle, not a two-dimensional bundle. But here's the Dirac operator thought of, for example, as acting on the exterior algebra bundle of the circle. Then it looks like the D that you see here. In general, uh, if we have a compact group, uh, or indeed a reductive group, the D that you're supposed to choose is, is the famous cubic Dirac operator of, of Koston. Uh, you'll see why that's uh, so. It's kind of important to choose the right Dirac operator, uh, and you'll see why that's so in, in due course. And, and what's special about Costin's operator, uh, which was designed, by the way, for an amazing purpose, which has nothing to do with anything that you might imagine. Uh, you sh it's really worth reading uh, Costin's original paper. Uh, it's, it's, a remarkable, it's remarkable that this operator came into being for, out of a context which involved no spinners whatsoever. Anyway, what's special about this operator is when you square it, you get the Casimir for the group. You get an operator which is very, not just for left translations, but also for right translations, very, very special. The Casimir plus a constant, which is not particularly important, especially in this talk, because mostly I'll talk about the circle, and, and then this constant is zero in the case of a circle. Okay, the way I wrote down the operator, it, it's, a, <coughs> as you see, a formally self-adjoint operator. Um, the, it's better, as you'll see at the end, to work not with a formally self-adjoint operator, but a skewer-adjoint operator. And so it's better to, to correct uh, what I've written at the top, or if you like, it's better not to have introduced the square root of minus one in the first place. Uh, and that's what Jean-Michel does. Um, but I think we're all more comfortable in this, in this audience with self-adjoint operators. So I stuck in the eye just to make us all happier. Okay, here's another slide I barely need to, to uh, show you for in this audience. Here's the super trace. Here's the super trace of, of the heat kernel. Uh, as everyone knows, it's in the context of 
the zeta graded operators, odd graded operators, it gives the index. And uh, it's just the final reminder that I want to focus on, which is that one way of understanding why the index uh, is coded inside the supertrace is you can take a derivative of the supertrace of the exponential of minus td squared with respect to t, and then just putting the derivative inside the supertrace and calculating the derivative of the exponential, what you find is you obtain a, a supercommutator like you see, and, and the, the, the supertrace of a supercommutator is zero. So that says that the derivative of the supertrace is zero with respect to t. In other words, the supertrace is constant. And if you let t go to infinity, then, then the, the operators inside of the argument, which are the argument of the supertrace, converge onto the projection on the kernel. And, and, and that's why you have this famous McCain-Singer formula uh, expressing the index as a supertrace. I remind you of this just because we'll see exactly the same thing uh, in due course. That's ingredient number one. Ingredient number two, similarly uh, familiar to everyone here. Here's the harmonic oscillator. Its spectrum is the odd positive uh, numbers, one, three, five. The ground state, the one eigenvalue is the exponential, the Gaussian. And you can sort of extract a square root. And as with the Dirac operator, this requires passing to uh, matrices, uh, which are just the exterior algebra of, of whatever vector space you're dealing with. Uh, and, and so everyone knows the creation and annihilation operators that you see here, and, and everyone knows this formula that Q squared is basically the harmonic oscillator up to some constants. Uh, and I, I won't really be working in more than one dimension, but if I was, the analogous formula would be the one at the very bottom of the page, where N is the, the number operator on forms. All right. One thing to keep in mind at this point before we go on is, is that the coefficient vector space, or if you like, the, the vector bundle on which these operators act, it's the same in both cases. I showed you the Dirac operator and it acts on lambda valued functions, exterior algebra valued functions. Same thing with Q, it acts on lambda valued functions, exterior algebra valued functions. How are we doing? All right, so now time for uh, Gennady's product, or maybe I should say the Atiyah Singer product, product, because this is what Gennady was uh, building from. If you have two manifolds, for example, two circles, and you have the Laplacian uh, on each of them, and you want to figure out what is the Laplacian on the product, then it's just the sum of the Laplacians. The Laplacian on a product of manifolds is the sum of the Laplacians. I mean that the first Laplacian acts on the first factor of the product and the second Laplacian acts on the second factor of the product. And, and what Atir and, and Singer worked out and, and Kasparov uh, worked out more thoroughly is what happens for the square roots. So the, now we take the square roots of the Laplacians, we have Dirac operators, D1 and, and D2. And uh, what is the formula for the Dirac operator on the product in terms of the uh, two Dirac operators on the two factors? Well, it's basically just the sum. Again, you best basically let D1 act on the first T and D2 act on the second T. And, that, and now there are coefficient vector spaces. So D1 should act on the first lambda. The coefficient matrices in D1 should act on the first lambda. And the coefficient matrices of D2 should act on the second. It's basically just that, but not exactly that. You have to strategically add some signs to make it all work out. And, and what you want uh, to have work out is that when you square the Dirac operator, you get to the, the Laplacian. So that means that the square of the Kasparov product, which is this pound sign, as they say here, uh, indicated by this pound sign here, the square of the Dirac product should be the sums of the squares of D1 and D2. And if you do that, then uh, first of all, you get, uh, it is indeed the case that you've now extracted a square root of the Laplacian. So you basically do have the Dirac operator on the product. Secondly, it's, it's well known to us that the index is multiplicative. This is this strange way of adding together two operators gives, gives the product of the Fredholm index. On the other hand, if you multiply two Fredholm operators, you get the sum of the index is as you know, so it's all kind of strange. So this Kasparov product is sort of mostly additive, but, but slightly non-additive enough to the extent that it recovers the product of indices. Okay, so these things, you know very well. And so uh, it's all relaxing. It's like floating down the river so far for um, everyone in this audience. Except maybe Jean-Michel, who's being tortured by, by me going in the wrong, from his point of view, the wrong direction. But anyway, let's just persevere. Now I'm going to, now I'm going to combine uh, the two operators, uh, the two ingredients that, that we have. D, the Dirac operator, operator, let's say on a circle, 
let's not overtax ourselves and, and Q the square root of the harmonic oscillator. And I shall do what Kasparov uh, tells us to do, which is just take that Kasparov product. And I'm going to stick in a parameter T, a positive uh, parameter. And the reason I'm going to do that is the formula in the middle of the slide, which shows that the product of D with Q or T times Q not only recovers the index of D, which it does because I think I forgot to say it, but the index of Q is a one. So the index of D product Q is just the same thing as the index of Q. You don't only recover the, the, the index of D from, from this construction of Kasparov, you actually recover the entire operator, which is D, from the product operator uh, in the sense, for example, of resolvent convergence. So if you take the resolvents of D product T times Q and you compare them to the resolvents of D, then in the limit as T gets really, really large, they're exactly the same as one another. What's going on here is that if, if you look at the kernel of Q as an operator on this large Hilbert space, L2 of T times R, uh, the kernel of Q you can identify with, with just, with just the, the Hilbert space on which the Dirac operator acts. In if the, what are the, the functions in the kernel of Q? Well, in the R direction, they have to be Gaussian, e to the minus y squared over two. And in the second factor of lambda, they have to be zero forms. But if you look at all functions which are in the R direction are Gaussian and in the second factor of lambda, they're only zero forms. That's just a copy of uh, functions of the first variable, uh, which are valued in the first uh, copy of lambda. In other words, that's just the Hilbert space on which D acts. So here's a, a very, very, very simple formula. And it's really, really easy to prove because the square of the Kasparov product is designed to be the sum of the squares. And Q squared is bounded below by um, one, I guess, if you remember the formula for Q, excuse me, the formula for Q squared. So T squared Q squared is bounded below by uh, T squared. This is on the orthogonal complement of the kernel. There is a kernel where it's not bounded below. On the orthogonal complement of the kernel, T squared Q squared is enormous. Uh, and so when you take uh, its reciprocal, you will get something which is really, really small. On the orthogonal complement of the kernel, this resolvent on the left-hand side of the formula is converging to zero. On the kernel itself, of course, Q is zero and you just see D. Uh, I forgot to say it in this slide, but it's rather important that in all of this, D maps the kernel space into itself. Otherwise it would be tremendously confusing. Uh, so this is an extremely easy uh, formula. And the only reason I'm going to, I really want to mention it at all is to, to point out that this is something that Jean-Michel uh, knows and knows and knows and knows. It's, it's almost an insult for me to explain this argument uh, and attach uh, on the same slide uh, Bis Bismuth's name. But, but uh, th this argument has many, many, many uh, deep and interesting uh, extensions. Uh, you can easily imagine situations in, in which rather than taking a product, you have some, you know, you some, some bundle uh, of, of vector spaces over a manifold, then it becomes much more interesting to understand what's going on. And that's, that's one of the many things that Jean-Michel is a great expert in. So as part of the creation story, you have to know that everything I've written down here is, is, is it, it's so basic that Jean-Michel doesn't even dream about it anymore. It's just part of who he is. All right, so now to the discovery uh, story. And um, so I'm going to try and uh, build the hypoelliptic, not build, but, but justify the formula for the hypoelliptic Laplacian on the basis of uh, a little calculation, which I'm sure is not uh, actually what, what happened. Uh, and we have Jean-Michel to tell us what actually happened. Uh, uh, he may just interrupt me shout me down, but we have him to tell us uh, what actually happened la later on. Um, but I, I think it's, it's, it's a fairly compelling story and, and sometimes, uh, sometimes you have to tell a good lie to really get to the truth. All right, uh, and so I'll explain, explain this as a sort of laboratory accident, like the discovery of penicillin or something. You know, let's see how it goes. Okay, and I don't really believe that this is what happened. I can imagine that, that the story is not actually so easy to tell in, in reality, because uh, just out of um, a wealth of experience, the, the, the idea that the construction would be a good construction probably just bubbled up. And so there, there may not have been a precise moment of discovery like I'm going to uh, pretend there was. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of algebra uh, and matrix theory, and then we'll get back to geometry. Then once we've done that, we'll have the operator, and then we have to do some, well, very in this talk, very, very elementary uh, geometry. Okay, back to the, the Kasparov product. This is exactly the product we were discussing before. Bread and, and butter for Jean-Michel. 
And of course, lambda is an exterior algebra, and uh, so it's an algebra. You can multiply forms together. So it's, it's a little tempting maybe to com compactify, compress, uh, streamline the construction just by multiplying the two lambdas together. It's either a little tempting or if, uh, you know, if you're an uh, inattentive student, uh, it's the sort of thing you might easily do by accident. So that's the accidental part of the discovery. Suppose we try to uh, build an equivalent operator on the, how to say, compressed space, not really compressed space, a sort of quotient space in which the two lambdas are, are multiplied together. The two copies of the exterior algebra are multiplied together. It's tempting to think that you might be able to do this, especially because, you know, when you build the Dirac operator, for example, you don't need the full exterior algebra. You only need the square root of the exterior algebra anyway, the spin of vector space. So there's a certain about, amount of, uh, I don't know, excess space involved in the original construction of D. Maybe something interesting happens. Let's just see. Let's just see what happens. Uh, now, what, what does this mean? I put a little bar over the Kasparov product. I mean, some ingenious construction. So the little bar is supposed to be read, some ingenious variation on Kasparov's product. Well, here's a not particularly ingenious variation on the product where I just add the operators together. So the first D acts on the circle, and of course its coefficient matrices act on lambda, and the second Q acts on the real line, and, and its coefficient matrices also act on lambda. So there's going to be a sort of collision here because we've taken the two sets of coefficient matrices, those for D and, and, and those for Q, and we've made them act on the same space, so they're not going to commute anymore. Uh, but Okay, let's just see. It's uh, in, in the spirit of experimentation, let's just see uh, what happens. Let me press the right key on the right keyboard. Well, this is what happens. Uh, well, the first line is just really dull. Uh, when, now when you, when you expand the square, there are cross terms, of course, D times Q plus Q times D, the anti-commutator, uh, and, and they don't go away like they did before because there's no room anymore for Kasparov's ingenious construction with strategically placed signs. And so, there is a cross term, there's nothing you can do, it's just there. Uh, and then there's T squared, Q squared, like there was before. Like you would expect, nothing, nothing too frightening there, because uh, after all, in many situations, when there is curvature, there's a cross term anyway, when you form some Kasparov product, I mean, a natural geometric Kasparov product. And in this particular case, something rather interesting happens, which is that when you actually calculate what the cross term is, it's the geodesic flow. So you make this lazy mistake to, to to write down the Kasparov product, uh, who has time for tensor products of two copies of the, uh, of the exterior algebra? You just write down one copy, you see what happens. Well, what happens is something rather interesting. Just a little, there's like a little crack of light towards shining towards geometry, or maybe from geometry, uh, which you see, which is the geodesic flow. Interesting, maybe. Well, but it's just a little glimmer. So now you, you might try and uh, explore this a, a little bit. For example, what happens to this resolvent formula that, that, that we had before, this uh, baby bismuth Lebeau formula, which I showed you uh, before. Well, it, it's, uh, okay, you think it's something interesting might happen. The in initial um, guidance from the calculations is, is not very encouraging because uh, before D preserved the kernel of Q, there was a simple direct product, excuse me, direct sum decomposition of the ambient Hilbert space on which all of these operators acted. Uh, and uh, everything was blocked diagonal, so it was very easy to see what's going on. That's exactly what doesn't happen here. Because you squashed everything together and paid no regards to Kasparov's instructions, uh, something strange happens, which is that D doesn't map the kernel into itself. In fact, it, it protests very strongly. It actually maps the kernel to its orthogonal complement and, 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 and vice versa. So it's all very confusing, and it doesn't seem like you're going to get very far. Well, if D maps the kernel to its orthogonal complement and vice versa, then at least D squared preserves the kernel. So, okay, let's just see what happens if we study D squared. After all, D squared is what we're really interested in if we're trying to understand something like Selberg. All right, so now we're going to do some calculations and I'm going to write down formulas for the square of D plus TQ. I'm going to write down formulas um, which uh, are with our two by two matrix block decompositions with respect to nothing to do with Z2 grading anymore, with respect to the decomposition of the Hilbert space of functions on T times the line into the kernel of Q on the one hand, those are the functions which are Gaussian in the Y direction uh, and, and zero forms uh, valued in zero forms uh, into the kernel of Q and then, then of course it's orthogonal complement. So I, I write down the square of D is a two by two matrix. There's a little bit of a simplification 
because I already said that d squared preserves the kernel, so d squared is always completely on the diagonal. Of course, q squared compressed to the kernel is just zero, so that's why there's no q squared in the one one term. Uh, and, and then I told you that, um, that uh, d switches the kernel and uh, the, its orthogonal complements, so the anti-commutator of d and q sits in this strange way distributed in the off-diagonal terms, part of it above the diagonal and part below the diagonal. It's a little bit interesting. Uh, and not what you would expect. It's a, just a little bit of new z2 graded algebra that we're not quite so familiar with. All right, great, let's just do it. Now we want to study the resolvents. I'm just going to pretend that uh, uh, the resolvent is the same thing as the inverse. And, and so we need to understand how to, here on the previous page, uh, there it is again, there's a certain two by two matrix and I want to invert it. Well, it's, if it was a bunch of numbers, it would be easy to invert, but if it's a, it's a block matrix and it takes a little more effort to invert a block matrix, not much. If you have a block matrix and if the one one entry is invertible, which is the case here, at least if T is big enough, then there's an easy formula for the inverse. We were looking, I was working with some friends, we were trying to understand this uh, formula and lazily, because it's modern, these days are modern times, what, what we did is we just you know, checked on the internet. Uh, we found a paper in computer science entirely devoted to this formula. So there you go. Uh, anyway, it's a true formula. This is how you invert a block two by two matrix in this situation in which D is an, an invertible matrix itself. And uh, the matrix E, which I've shown here, uh, written here, plays a, a prominent role. It ends up being the one one entry of the inverse and it's A minus BD inverse C. Okay. So that's the formula for the inverse of a two by two matrix. What happens if you plug that into the case that we're interested in, which I remind you is this matrix here. Sorry for going backwards and forwards. Now back to the calculation. Well, it becomes relevant to know what this E matrix is. And, and here's what it is. If you just um, carry a dim, dim memory of the formula I flashed at you forward onto this page, you'll get this, this difference, D squared minus D times a certain fraction times D. And without paying too much attention to the analysis, what you see in the numerator of this fraction, the, the leading order behavior in T is Q squared, and in, in the denominator, the leading order of the B, uh, behavior in T is Q squared. So it's Q squared over Q squared, it's one. So in the limit, you get D squared minus D squared, you get zero. Well, that's not good because you're trying to recover the resolvent of D and what you manage to do is make D disappear. It's kind of miraculous by itself that in this, new construction, uh, rather than getting this bismuth lebow type formula, you get on the nose zero. Rather interesting, but not good. Not good for us if we're trying to say something intelligent about e to the minus uh, d squared, e to the minus uh, t d squared, then to have d disappear is, is not such a good thing. Okay, so there's another disappointment. First of all, we saw that d doesn't preserve the kernel. Now we see d squared, even though it does preserve the kernel, just disappearing from the formula. But all is not lost uh, because the reason that d squared disappears is extremely simple. Uh, I, I wrote down again the operator d plus tq squared and, and there was a d squared in the one one entry. Uh, and that was really the culprit. Uh, that one one entry of the top matrix uh, caused the, the, the E matrix on the previous page to be zero because it subtracted away an interesting manifestation of d squared. So fine, let's just subtract out d squared. I mean, why not? Uh, and then you actually get an easier two by two matrix. Here it is. I just subtracted out the diagonal D squared terms. Now, if you take the inverse or resolvent of this, then it's, it's much better because the E matrix here is converging, at least informally, we're not doing any analysis, uh, converging to, well, it's converging to minus D squared. Let me uh, just, can I go back one? Is it just here? Yeah, there's a, there's a minus sign you see in this formula. E is A minus BD inverse C. E is D squared minus D blah, 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 D. Uh, so you get a, a minus sign there. That's not altogether perfect. And this is one of the reasons why you want to do a small adjustment and replace D by root minus one times D. Uh, and when you do that, uh, what happens uh, is, is, is uh, minus D squared, of course, becomes plus D squared. And now this uh, new operator, which I've defined, does indeed converge in the resolvent sense uh, to the Laplacian on D, which is the same thing as the restriction of D squared to the kernel of Q. All right, so let's try and uh, summarize uh, here. Let's, let's, let's make a precise statement. I mean, why not uh, just in finite dimensions, just for encouragement's uh, sake, if you have a couple of operators and if they're now 
finite dimensional, just to make, uh, so they act on a finite dimensional graded Hilbert space, just to make a precise statement, uh, just for the sake of encouragement, of course, the operators in real life aren't like this. Uh, if you have two operators and if d squared commutes with q, which is the case, uh, which I'll explain in a moment, I'll finish uh, speaking uh, this slide first. Uh, oh, and a crucial fact, which has to do with the, the Z2 grading of the situation, you want the kernel of Q to be entirely even graded. If you have all of these things, then the sort of convergence that I was just uh, wishing to be correct um, in the previous slide is, is indeed a, a correct, uh, is indeed correct. The operators LT that, you, that I built on the previous slide, just out of uh, a sense of optimism, do indeed converge in the resolvance sense to the, to the operator D squared, restricted to the kernel. And moreover, they converge well enough that after you take traces, you get resolvent, you get convergence of, of super traces here. And the beautiful fact about this formula, uh, which is a result of Q, the kernel of Q being entirely even graded, the beautiful fact is that on the right-hand side, it's a trace, and on the left-hand side, it's a super trace. So you see the trace of the exponential of e to the minus t times the Laplacian, if you like, uh, that's what you expect, to, that's what you we're going to see in, in the applications. That thing is, is realized as a supertrace, exactly like you see in this slide. And as a marvelous bonus, the derivative with respect to big T of the supertrace is equal to zero. That is the final statement as a result of d squared commuting with q. The reason it's uh, appropriate to, to assume that d squared commutes with q uh, think, you know, with our model in mind, is that d squared is the, is, is the Casimir operator, and the Casimir is it's in the center of the enveloping algebra. It commutes with everything. Uh, it's just a, a scalar operator in the center of the enveloping algebra. Of course, it commutes with Q in the application we have in mind. So that's one of the reasons to select the, the cost and top uh, Dirac operator in the first place. It's extremely encouraging, this theorem, even though it's just a theorem about uh, matrices. And so here it is. Here's the the official hyperelliptic uh, Laplacian. Uh, I, I never asked Jean-Michel this, why, why it's B, little b instead of some other letter, but, but anyway, uh, Jean-Michel uses one over B instead of big T. Uh, and he also divides by two because in the formula for the, some earlier formula for the, for the wrong, Kasp uh, wrong Kasparov product, we got two times the geodesic flow. Now, if we divide by two, we'll get one times the geodesic flow. So you divide by two, that's no big deal. Uh, you, you call big T one over B, also no big deal. Uh, and now you get exactly the operator I wrote down before in the case of a circle or something a little bit more complicated in the case of a compact group. There are a few extra spurious terms in, in the compact group case, which turn out not to be particularly relevant. Uh, you don't exactly get the geodesic flow from that super commutator, but you get the geodesic flow and some terms which are allowed to more or less ignore. Okay, so just to summarize, um, if you make a wrong decision about Kasparov's uh, product, uh, then you, you make a marvelous discovery, just a little hint of a discovery that the geodesic flow appears in a, in a formula for the square. Uh, and uh, if you attempt to follow your instincts, uh, which if you're Jean-Michel are very considerable, uh, you will end up making this rather am uh, amazing construction that you see at the top of the slide, in which you take a Laplacian type operator, that's the first term, but then you, you add or take away, depending on how you look at it, the operator that you're actually interested in. It's kind of amazing. You know, when you write down this formula for LB, what you're really interested in is, is the Laplacian on the circle, d squared dx squared, but you make a conscious effort in the formula for L to subtract out d squared dx squared. It's kind of amazing that you would do this and, and still uh, obtain a, a remarkable tool to analyze just that, d squared dx squared, the Laplacian on the circle. So this whole formula, the way I've uh, presented it to you, is exclusively designed so that you obtain the trace of the heat kernel as a supertrace, which is invariant uh, under variation of the parameter b. Uh, and we didn't do any analysis yet, except for some simple stuff with finite matrices, so we've got a ways to go. Um, but, but I hope that that makes the, the formula for the hyperelliptic Laplacian at least a, just a little bit plausible. How are we doing? Doing okay time-wise. So there are some theorems to go uh, along with, um, I don't know if I put this on this slide, uh, let me just see, I guess it's somewhere else. Uh, so to, to go along with, um, oh, I remember what I did. Uh, to, to go along with the, the optimistic algebra, uh, the hypoelliptic Laplacian, as, as you might expect, uh, is indeed a hypoelliptic operator. Um, 
So that in, that's an encouraging fact about its analysis. It's not by itself that helpful because uh, hypoelliptricity is not a, not a very quantitative uh, statement, but it is true it's a hypoelliptic operator. It is true that the, um, it is the generator of a one parameter semigroup. After all, not every operator is, but this is a, a maximally accretive operator. It does generate a one parameter semigroup. And the one parameter sem semigroup does consist of trace class operators. Uh, and so you can take the trace. Uh, and it is true that the trace de depends smoothly on the parameters t and b. And so you can take the derivative. I made a mistake in this, uh, uh, rather crucial mistake in this uh, middle theorem. I said the derivative with respect to t of the supertrace is zero. Uh, I meant to say the derivative with respect to b of the supertrace is zero. So that, that is true. And, and finally, it is true that the limit of the supertrace, of course, the supertrace is no longer varying with b. But as you do the calculation, the limit as b goes to zero of the supertrace of the hypoelliptic Laplacian heat kernel is the usual heat kernel on the torus, on the circle in this particular case. Okay, so these are analytic guarantees that the games we were playing on the previous slides are, are, are meaningful. Just a few more uh, comments uh, about this, just about how you actually go about, can go about proving these things. I'm, I'm mostly writing these down to indicate to you just that, that it's not trivial uh, what happens. Here's a toy model operator. It just acts on a compact torus, this operator P that you see at the top. It's a good model for, for this uh, operator. I made, uh, instead of Y DDX, I have sine of Y DDX just to make a periodic operator which really exists on, on the torus. Uh, this is an example of a, a hypoelliptic operator according to a famous theorem of, of, of Homander. Um, but to make things quantitative, it's useful to obtain uh, sub-elliptic estimates, estimates in sub norms. And, and I write these down just to show you that it's a little bit, you know, it can't be completely trivial what's going on. Uh, the, the, uh, the operator P improves or is, is sub-elliptic to the extent of one quarter of a sub norm. It behaves like an elliptic operator of order one quarter as far as uh, uh, elliptic estimates uh, are concerned, fundamental uh, Godding type uh, estimates. So that's a little bit uh, strange. And uh, the method to prove this is ultimately due to Homander, but there's an ingenious calculus that uh, JJ Cohn invented, which makes the whole thing very algebraic, and that's very convenient for us. Um, so I'm, I'm following here Cohn's uh, method, which produces uh, this sub of estimate of one quarter. Just to show you just how tricky uh, this is, if you want to localize this estimate to an open set inside of uh, the two torus, then you have to pay a price. The local version of this global estimate involves a, an improvement in the sub of exponent of just one over eight, not one quarter, but one over eight. So it's, it's systematic and algebraic what you have to do, but it, it can't be completely trivial when you start to see numbers like one quarter and, and one eighth in, involved. Anyway, this is the analytical behavior of the operator P. And it's very similar for the, the, the actual hyperelliptic Laplacian operator. Uh, the only difference is that it's, it's not really appropriate to deal with usual pseudo-differential operators because you have to take the non-compact direction of this uh, cylinder into account, or generally the compact group times the Lie algebra into account. And so I've been thinking about this with my uh, Australian friends at the bottom, Asimov, McDonald, Sukhachev, and Zanin. And we decided that the right way, or at least as, uh, an effective way of proceeding, is to work with the pseudo-differential calculus associated to this Laplacian that you see at the top of the slide with the big theta. It's a strange operator. It's the square of the harmonic oscillator. So that has order four in the usual sense, and you add it to the Laplacian on the circle, or the Casimir, if you like, in the case of a group, which is order two in the usual sense. But we just decree that this thing has order two, and we build a calculus around this, so to speak, Laplacian. Uh, how do we do it? Well, Karno Moscovich indicated how to um, organize a, a sort of primitive pseudo-differential calculus, which is focused on making estimates for commutators, which fortunately is exactly what Kohn's method is all about. So we use this Karno Moscovich calculus, and we duplicate what Cohn and uh, before him Homander did, and we obtain versions of the theorems that I showed you before with the same exponents, one quarter and one eighth. And we obtain that this operator is maximally accretive and that there's a Schwartz class semigroup attached to it and so on and so forth. So the analysis is okay. All right, and just to, to summarize, uh, yeah, about 10 minutes to go. Just to summarize, here's where we are. Uh, 
there is this marvelous family discovered by, by Jean-Michel, but it's discovered according to the creation story I just uh, showed you. It does capture through its super trace of, of its uh, heat fam uh, semi group, it does capture the spectrum of, uh, it, well, in this case, the circle or a compact group. Uh, it does offer the opportunity to, to produce interesting formulas because the derivative of the super trace with respect to the parameter b, I got it right this time, is, is equal to zero. And so if you can evaluate the limit as b goes to infinity uh, uh, of the super trace in a different way using geometry, geometry, you'll be in good shape. You'll have a theorem. And that's exactly what's going to uh, happen. Yeah, remember that the limit as b goes to zero is like the limit as big T in my notation goes to infinity. And that that limit turned out to be spectral, and that's what we used basically to define the hyperelliptic Laplacian. So there's no point looking at what happens as b goes to zero, but as b goes to infinity, maybe you get something interesting. And so in the last uh, few slides, I, I, I want to try to just indicate to you where the geometry comes from, um, which is very, very simple. And I have a feeling that this, I mean, Jean-Michel is here, he can confirm it or deny it. This is probably a more likely uh, origin story than the, the previous uh, slides. Uh, let me just simplify my life a little bit by dealing with this scalar operator instead of the matrix operators. This obviously is the essence of the matter, this operator you see up here. Uh, and actually for the next couple of slides, I'm going to simplify matters even more and study uh, the operator in red, which was uh, first studied by Kolmogorov in the 1930s. Uh, and now I want to think of it as operating on the plane. Just to make a certain pedagogical point, I want to deal with this operator K. And uh, so the question is, that this geodesic flow term, YDDX, what does it do to the heat kernel? And, and so let me try and explain that to you as simply as I can in, in the next couple of slides. Suppose you have a solution of the heat equation in which you replace the Laplacian by K. So we're operating on the plane. Heat is propagating, so to speak, according to a differential equation involving K, not uh, the usual Laplacian. And the solution, the way that heat propagates, so to speak, heat in quotation marks propagates, I'll call ut. And uh, let's just see what happens to this solution. How does it move as time goes on? Or what does it mean for it to move? Suppose you take the solution and uh, attach to it a center of mass. This heat, heat semigroup is, is positive. It preserves positivity. And so it's reasonable to speak in terms of you know, mass uh, uh, picturesquely. Uh, if you have a distribution of mass ut, then its center of mass is the point in the plane given by these coordinates, of course. And uh, so you can ask, how is the bulk of the solution uh, located as, as time uh, increases? And it's rather interesting. You, you look at this formula involving integrals over the plane, and now you differentiate with respect to t. Well, you can differentiate under the integral sign. Let's pay no attention to the legality of, the legality of that. Just do it. If you differentiate under the integral sign, and you use the fact that ut is a solution of the heat equation, then of course you can replace the t derivative by the k derivative. And then you move the k over from applying on operating on ut to operating on x and y using you know, formal adjoints. Then you'll end up with this easy formula. The derivative of the center of mass is the y component of the center of mass comma zero. In other words, the derivative of the y component of the center of the mass is zero. But as for the x component, it's drifting, it's drifting at a uniform rate, either to the left or the right in the plane, according to whether the, the mass is located above the x-axis or below the x-axis. So what the YDDX term does, uh, we said geodesic flow before, but now I'm using some different, more relaxed language. It's drift, it's causing solutions to drift either to the left or the right in a sort of shearing way, uh, depending on whether you're above or below the x-axis. Here's a cartoon, a um, little bit of entertainment to indicate what's going on. Here's a little glob. Uh, which is supposed to be where the bulk of some initial u0 is, is located on the left. And then as, as you run time, the blob drifts to the right. It tends to stretch out um, this operator. Actually, it's finite propagation in, in no direction, uh, but it's hard to draw it unless you make some compromises. Uh, it tends to, the distribution tends to stretch out much more in the y direction than the x direction, although it stretch out, st stretches out in every direction. And off it goes, it just moves, it just moves. It just starts to go all by itself. It's not what you see for the heat equation. If you solve the heat equation with a blob right here, centered around the origin, centered around State College, Pennsylvania, that's where the center of, of mass will stay. It'll stay warmer in State College than anywhere else with the usual heat equation. If you, if you light a fire in State College and see what happens, well, 
we're the ones that will, that will stay warm, uh, not you guys. Sorry about that. But that's not the case with Kolmogorov's equation. I light a fire here, all of a sudden you're feeling pretty nice in Nijmegen. It's warming up nicely. Not all of a sudden, but after a certain amount of time. So there's some interesting dynamics attached to the K heat equation, the, which you don't see for the usual heat equation. Okay, here's a little bit of mathematics to, to, to bulk that up. Uh, it's, in, in, in this game, it's more important to study small time behavior than, than big time behavior. Large B is more or less the same thing as small time. And uh, as we know for small time asymptotics of the heat kernel, the heat kernel tends to concentrate on the diagonal. If you have two functions on a compact manifold which are disjointly supported, and you sandwich the heat operator between them, then the, the norm, any reasonable norm of, of the composition, sigma one heat kernel sigma zero, is going to decay exponentially fast. It's even better than exponentially fast. It's, well, like you see, e to the minus one over t fast as t goes to zero. All right, so that's just how the usual heat kernel behaves. There's a beautiful variation of this uh, due to, well, it's not due to Garding and Gaffney, but due to a method uh, that they established. Suppose you uh, now take the function sigma one, sigma two. Now I'm going to call the functions phi, I guess, at the bottom. Suppose phi is a function on the circle. Build this drifting version of phi on the cylinder in which, given by the formula that you see. I'll have a picture, I think, on the next slide. Here we go. If you insert into the previous formula the drifted version of phi, then you get, again, uh, a decay, uh, a concentration phenomenon for the heat kernel of the hypoelliptic Laplacian, but it's not a concentration uh, phenomenon involving concentration on the diagonal, it's concentration on a drifted diagonal. If you have a function, what does the drifted diagonal mean? Well, I mean, uh, for example, the red strip cross the blue spiral, uh, that's the subspace of the cylinder times the cylinder, uh, and it's part of the drifted diagonal. If you have a function which is substantially concentrated in the red area and you apply the heat equation, even for very, very tiny times, then you'll get uh, a function which is substantially concentrated in this drifted blue version of the red stripe. And if you're on a compact manifold like the circle, this thing is going to inevitably wind around and around and around. The slope, I've, I've grotesquely exaggerated, the slope goes to infinity as t goes to zero, um, but of course it's still going to wind around and around and around infinitely often. And this leads to, of course, when you when you take the trace of an operator, you're exactly compressing the operator to the diagonal. And if the diagonal is not the same as the drifted diagonal, you're going to find a concentration phenomenon for the trace. It will be concentrated only where the diagonal intersects the drifted diagonal, which is roughly speaking in the green part of this diagram here. And the trace of the heat kernel for the L, for the hypoelliptic Laplacian operator, will not involve integrating over all space. It will just be involve integrating over geodesic bands, more or less the green parts of the diagram that I've shown you here. So you see geometry entering exactly through this YDDX term, exactly as you would hope, you know, the moment you first glimmered it uh, in that first accidental discovery. Just one slide to um, uh, indicate the mathematics behind this. I, I won't dwell on it very much. Back in the 1950s or early 60s, People were interested in, in heat flow on groups, and they were interested not in small time behavior, but large distance behavior. What does the heat kernel look like on, on a Lie group in, in large distances? And so this problem was studied in connection with representation theory by Lars Goding. Uh, and he obtained a, a very beautiful uh, identity. It's really trivial, uh, which you see at the top here. If you have a solution of the heat equation and you multiply it by a function and you differentiate with respect to time, well, you can just expand the norms as inner products and collect the terms, and this is what you get. Some complicated thing involving a difference. I missed out at two, it should be, the negative term should be two. Uh, I don't care because the next thing I'm going to do is drop the negative term and you obtain an inequality. The derivative of phi times ut is bounded by some quantity depending only on the gradient of phi. That's the Gardin gaffney uh, in inequality. There's a, there's a beautiful version of this for the, for the hypoelliptic Laplacian, and it involves these drifted uh, functions, and it's exactly the same inequality, but now it involves the drifted functions. What's going on here is that the extra terms you ha would have to confront in, in doing the calculation at the very top of this slide involving y ddx and also involving differentiation with respect to t. Now the function phi depends on t. They're designed to exactly cancel out 
uh, this is what people do when they prove the finite propagation speed for, for hyper, hyperelliptic first order equations. So is this something I, I learned from John Rowe, that you can make uh, cancellations happen very nicely and you get exactly the same inequality uh, for the heat, for the hyperelliptic Laplacian as you do for the usual Laplacian, uh, as you see. So you're supposed to be comparing regarding you know, the last two formulas in red, the, the two inequalities, which basically look exactly the same. Um, I should have said Nabla sub B in the formula, another typo. I guess you can probably figure that out. So once you have this, you just have to figure out what Garding and Gaffney did to get small time asymptotics. It's only two lines, but, but to figure out which two lines are supposed to, you're supposed to write down to go from these estimates to the decay estimates I showed you earlier. It's, it's an interesting puzzle. I'm just going to leave that uh, to you. All right, so now you're in business. Uh, I, I'm not going to spend uh, much time because my time is up uh, on this. We've already seen that the, the, the heat kernel of the hyperelliptic Laplacian concentrates on geodesic bands. Uh, the geodesic bands, by the way, are getting really, really thin. They, they have a width uh, about one over B. So as B goes to infinity, they get really, really thin. If you do a change of variables, to normalize the lengths and the widths of these bands so they all have unit width. then what you find is that under change of variables, uh, uh, Jean-Michel's operator L can actually converges to, to Kolmogorov's operator K. And so you get a formula for the heat kernel, the, the heat trace, super trace that Jean-Michel studies in terms of Kolmogorov's kernel exponential of minus TK. And the good news is that Kolmogorov was kind enough to explicitly work out what his heat kernel is just like Mailer was kind enough to explicitly work out the heat kernel for the, for the harmonic oscillator. It's some kind of crazy formula, which is uh, not so easy to look at. Uh, I wrote it all down so you can see this drift phenomenon if you're paying close attention as, as t goes to zero or b goes to infinity. Because we're only interested in a trace, we can set x equal to x1 equal to x2 and y1 equal to y2. That simplifies the formula a lot. Now it's just a usual Gaussian, so you can do the integral. Uh, and you get a formula for the supertrace, the thing in the bottom. And it's the right-hand side of the Poisson summation formula. We already had the left-hand side, that was the small b behavior. That's the reason we built the hyperelliptic Laplacian in the first place. And now we see on, on, on the right-hand side uh, of this final formula, the other side of the Poisson summation formula. So we proved the Poisson summation formula in the world's most complicated uh, Sorry, way. Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. Yes, yeah, Siri, don't, don't butt in. Okay. Uh, it remains just to say thank you. And now it's Jean-Michel's turn to, to speak. <laughs> okay, so should I say something? Okay. You just sp sp don't spare, don't spare me, don't spare me. <laughs> no, 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 not, no, no, not at all. So you outline a way to approach this, but originally, I mean, when I worked on this, of course, I never had any of these ideas at all. I never had an idea of putting the harmonic oscillator and the thing together to join the two, to make the mix, hope the geodesic flow would appear out of this. This was a reinterpretation that, you know, I, I had worked using the functional integral analogy that is saying, yeah. okay, so let me put it briefly. We have situations where in effect, like in Zellberg's trace formula, you concentrate on geodesics. So geodesics, is where the acceleration of a pass vanishes, x double dot equals zero. Yeah. Now, if you just look in the phase space, so x double dot equals zero means that you have the phase space, meaning if you have the trajectory, phase space is x, x dot. So you look at x dot, and there where x dot does not move. So this corresponds to the, in some sense, to points in phase space, the points in which the coordinate in the phase does not change. Now in index theory, when you have, when you prove index theorem, you concentrate things also on points in the space in which actually the point does not move. And so the idea of concentration of geodesics was to say, okay, if you believe that there is some index theoretic content to this Selberg's trace formula, you concentrate in some sense on points in phase space, but so how could these points emerge mm -hmm. as points? Instead of looking at the points on the base, how are they going to make out in the fiber? 
So actually, I devised a sort of formal argument. I mean, exactly like when you prove Poincaré Lenoir equation, where you concentrate on the zeros of some section from the functional integral point of view, it was easy, relatively easy to see how to force concentration on the zeros of this specific section, which is x double dot, how to force concentration on x double dot equals zero. And when doing that, I tried to retranslate this concentration from a functional cohomological point of view to operators. And to my amazement, I got this operator, which is harmonic oscillator plus geodesic flow plus something else. And I was totally puzzled. I mean, I was puzzled between myself and myself because of course, I mean, the ideas I had at the time were difficult to communicate. I did not even know what they, you know, how to formulate them. But then I found out effectively that in the case of the circle, the thing that I was hoping, which was a conservation of something by cohomological argument, like an index, something has to be preserved. That now there was this argument that you outline in construction that suddenly there was a conservation of the super trace. So at that point, I was totally amazed because that meant that ineffectively, if there is something which is conserved of this kind, which is not just a mass like one, but something much more sophisticated, that means that there must be an index, effective index theoretic formalism, which is not a formal thing. And then the question was, now I had this harmonic oscillator plus the easy flow, but where is the Dirac operator? Where is mm -hmm. it? I did not have any idea where it was. So I had to again to construct a bit. And then finally, in the case of the circle, I sort of obtained a sort of consistent theory, but really it's significant. I mean, what it meant really, especially going to compact groups and so on, this was not done much later, much later. So I certainly did not okay. have any of this clear cut view of taking right. two packages, making them to interact, produce the right thing and see. I did not know, yeah. not yeah. at all. No, I, I was yeah, especially I would... confused about the rule of having actually symplectic geometry in certain yes. contexts. You really have the symplectic geometry coming in this context. I had no hint of why this should be true. And even now, I must say, I'm still not yes. sure. I think that's very tantalizing what you have in your survey paper. The discussion of the role of symplectic geometry is um, yes, yes, yes. Like, so for the future, possible. I guess. There is something that you do also between Lagrangian and Hamiltonian pieces in quantum mechanics, and in this yeah. case, there is also Lagrangian point of view, Hamiltonian, but literally speaking, Hamiltonian equations. Yes, so moving from Lagrangian equation x double dot equals zero, which is an equation in base space to an equation in phase space, where you pass from order two to order one. That's a very, so there is also this aspect. So there are a number of things. And ultimately, I think that these things you can approach from, from as many points of view yeah. as you can, and they are all right. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. I, I, I would say I got something right, which is that the, the actual creation story is, is very complicated and involve many different parts of your experience. Uh, so to tell a story, um, you know, someone, something has to change. And, and so, okay, so I told this story. <laughs> I said it was counterfactual. Yeah, of course. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I told you, everything is right. Yes. Thank you. Let's see. Do we have other comments or questions? Seems no. Yeah, I would be interested in uh, the cyber trace formula in the uh, non co compact case. I'm wondering uh, what is the difficulty in that case? That may be a, a question that, that Jean Michel. So, what's difficult, of course, is that the operators are not in, in the trace class. There's no 
a ready way of um, accessing the, the formula just from the, the trace alone, because you have to renormalize, you have to subtract off the continuous spectrum. And of course, in, in, in low dimensions, in the, in the case of uh, rank one, there are scattering theory methods which do that, how to say, within our framework, within, within the framework of you know, Hilbert space operator theory. Uh, due to Lax and Phillips. So it, it's possible that you could combine some Lax Phillips approach with, with what Jean Michel is doing. But, but maybe Jean Michel has, has more, more to say than I do about that. Yeah. So, so in, in this context, the uh, thing that you're alluding about, I mean, when you look at this high politic Laplacian, actually, there is no discrete group. I mean, we got rid of the discrete group because mm -hmm. actually we look at semi-simple orbital integral. So yeah. these are the ones which are the piece in compact quotients, mm -hmm. where effectively you can reduce to gamma by gamma. Yeah. As soon as you go on locally symmetric space, non-compact, then the discrete group is there. And you cannot speak, you cannot sort of forget about the discrete group just looking piece by piece gamma gamma by gamma simply because it does not make you know if you just think about this it does not make any sense so you're forced to introduce the group gamma so at that point you're not dealing already with just one single object you're dealing with a whole infinite collection of them because you have to already the whole group of gamma and actually you know it's not only dealing with a group is really understanding also geometrically how does the group gamma ultimately produce this cusp, which in rank one is easy to understand. In higher rank, it's much more sophisticated. So you're already facing two difficulties. One is analytic, that the operator is not trace class. And the other one is geometric, that the geometry at infinity can, in some cases it's simple, in other cases it's very complicated. So the case which I dealt with, where the case where effectively you can forget in some sense about the spectrum, but also forget about the geometry. The geometry is relatively simple. You look at semi-simple elements and there is no spectral theory at all. You deal orbital integral with orbital integrals. <clears throat> all of this is destroyed in the context you're describing. You cannot separate, you know, you have to deal with all things together. If you take the, I, I just learned this the other day, if you take all of the semi-simple contributions to the trace formula, all of the semi-simple orbital integrals together, uh, they, they add up to a finite quantity. The, the semi-simple part of the trace is perfectly well-defined. It's only the unipotent part which, which, is, um, which is at stake. And if you could reduce to just the unipotent subgroup, let's say of SL2Z, that seems like uh, that, would be, that would be good progress. Then, of course, it's just the group uh, Z then. It's just an abelian group. Uh, I, I wonder if it's, if, if it's possible to... For rank, for rank one. I'm just talking about rank one, yeah, yeah, yeah. and indeed rank, just about yeah. SLL2. Yeah. I think that in rank one, the thing, I mean, because even from the spectral theoretic point of view, it's not too, it's not yeah. too, I mean, the point about the really outer trace formula is that you have two things which do not make sense, neither the left-hand side nor the right-hand side. And so you yeah. have to subtract off the pieces yeah. so, you know, and subtract them in a compatible way so that ultimately you compute what you want. So yeah. there is no way the high quality Laplacian is going to destroy any of the sort of difficulties. I mean, they are absolutely yeah. Yeah. there. They have to be there. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it can be an instrument in certain cases. Maybe it will prove to be, maybe it won't prove to be. Okay, that's, we have to be, to keep our strategy open there. Yeah. But I think that basically maybe it reduces case to semi-simple case and then moving to the limit, okay? After all, we have the semi-simple orbital intervals. We can take the limit of those in many, many ways. Yeah. So <clears throat> the idea of taking the limit can be exploited. I mean, we exploit this, we should tend to compute all the semi-simple orbital intervals of the one with Casimir, but they have all the possibility of taking the limits, combining mm -hmm. them, adding them, you know. So yeah. this space is left to you. <laughs> yeah, just, just to maybe add something uh, encouraging, it, it, uh, as, as opposed to being d discouraging. 
uh, if you confine your attention to the identity element, as I said, uh, which was the, the preoccupation of Harish Chandra, there's a lot to be said just there. So far from um, far from the, these unipotent problems, e even studying the identity element uh, seems to lead to some uh, a rich variety of phenomena in classical representation theory, entirely new ways of approaching some issues in, in representation theory. So this tool of the hyperelliptic potassium, of course, is not going to cut, uh, re kill every problem, but, but um, even small parts of it, the easiest parts in a way from the analytical point of view associated to the identity element, uh, seem to be in unexpectedly powerful in, in classical representation theory. So that's something else which I think uh, deserves um, a thorough explanation. As I mentioned, Yan Li and Xu are not involved in that. We have two formulas for the same thing in some sense. Yeah. We have two formulas for the same thing, which are two sort of local formulas in a certain way. That is, which reduce things more or less to the Lie algebra, I mean, to Cartan subalgebras uh, sub or to, you know, mm -hmm. what I did and so on. So we have two local formulas. How, how can it be that it's so hard? I mean, you know, that it's, it's a matter of our young students to work on that. But that they the can, that two different formulas which are local in their own way, yeah. which cannot sort of be easily sort of connected between themselves. What's, what's complicated or uh, what's, what's difficult to incorporate into the computation are, are, are K multiplicities. Um, when, when you uh, do a calculation um, related to the Planchot measure, you, you fix a representation of K. So you're studying representations with a fixed K multiplicity. And that's not at all what, what Harish Chandra does. It's not relevant to Harish Chandra what the K multiplicities are at all. And, and so uh, there's more to reconciling these two integrals than you know, just doing a change of variables. Uh, you, you have to investigate the actual representation spaces, but that's what makes the method uh, quite powerful and interesting. It, your method has um, K multiplicities, multiplicities built into it, whereas Harris Chandra's method does not. So that's both good and bad. It makes the problem difficult of reconciling them. It, it makes it um, you know, potentially valuable when you do make this reconciliation. So you, you, you mean that between the two formulas, there is still harmonic analysis going on? Yes. To yeah. make that from passing from one to the other, yeah. we have still to, re, to, in some sense, to resurrect the harmonic analysis package that yeah. we strive so hard to eliminate in some way. <laughs> well, you put it this way. If, if you're willing to accept both formulas, then, then, then you have a new powerful tool uh, in understanding harmonic analysis when you, when you, when you d turn to this question of k-multiplicities, because the two formulas have implications about k-multiplicities, which are rather interesting. I see. So there would be uh, not, I mean, so that their equality would be non-trivial. I mean, when yes. I'm saying trivial. Yes. That, that exactly. equality has a content. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot, uh, a lot going on. It's, uh, and it's very early, in very early days. As you say, we need lots of young people to, uh, <laughs> to sort these things out. Yeah. You guys out there. Yeah. Thanks for the nice lectures and uh, comments. Uh, do we have more questions? Um, if no, let us thank uh, Nigel again for his very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the end. Thank you. See bye you bye. next time. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you, Jamesha. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Mm -hmm.